The Liberating Arts seeks to articulate the enduring relevance of a liberal arts education during a time of pandemic and protest. Through our online platform, we will host a series of conversations with writers, academics, institutional leaders, and public intellectuals about the nature of the liberal arts, their formational purpose, and their moral significance in a time of great cultural disruption. We hope to inspire viewers and listeners to learn more about the liberating effects of these arts on their own lives. To find out more, please visit www.theliberatingarts.org or find us on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, or YouTube. Makoto Fujimara is a 21st century artist with studios on both coasts, Fuller Seminary, as well as near Princeton. And in addition to his artistic creations, which you get to see, I think, some behind him, he's the author of numerous books, including Culture Care, Silence and Beauty, which I loved, and in December 2020, Art and Faith, which we are going to get to discuss today. Um, welcome. Would you like to add anything to that introduction? Things people should know well, about. Thank you. I'm here in Princeton. I haven't been able to get to my Pasadena studio in a while, and uh, I, I am uh, my duties at Fuller Seminary was over in January. So I'm, um, I, but I kept the uh, studio there to continue to work with my fellows, uh, which I'm grateful for. And uh, yeah, I have an amazing community, which I miss. I was just on a Zoom call with uh, two of them. And uh, I, I was just like, you know, <laughs> I wish I could hug you. But, uh, you know, such is the time we live in. Right. Well, I mean, that conversation between art and faith, I'm sure that you were able to have here. And now that you're expanding upon in your book, yeah. I'm really excited to hear you kind of unpack these things. The, the subtitle of the book is The Theology of Making. Yeah. And for someone like me, who's a huge Dorothy Sayers fan, I oh. just keep hearing the resonance, the mind of the maker. So, but would you mind unpacking what you mean by that? What is the theology of making? Yeah, so I, I quote Dorothy Sayers um, uh, as I uh, discuss this entry into what I also call theology of new creation. And this has a lot to do with my conversations with theologians uh, such as N.T. Wright, uh, and, uh, Dr. Aaron Davis at Duke, uh, Mirzoff Wolf, and, and others over the years that we, we've discussed uh, this lack of um, connection between uh, what we make with our hands, what we experience uh, physically, uh, with this intellectualized, rationalized knowledge. Um, and um, I, I make a, a huge, um, um, create a context for this by saying that we don't know anything until we make, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which can be contested, I suppose. But, but it really is uh, the thesis of the book is that, especially when it comes to theology, until it is incarnated in, in tangible, um, physical ways, um, we did not know deeply or loved deeply enough what we believe. Well, because of your book, I actually bought Dr. Davis's Scripture and Culture and Agriculture. <laughs> yes, so important, such an important book. Yep, I just started diving into that. And I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, it is so far, I'm only in two chapters into it, but she makes great arguments and she actually uses poetry and almost makes things within the theology, yeah. the way that yeah. she crafts it. Yeah, agrarian poetry, right? So so that, right. that, that is fundamental to understanding the Bible. And mm -hmm. we don't understand agrarianism, a lot of us, um, you know, and we don't understand poetry. So we end up missing a lot of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we forget so much about what we are as creatures, which you're reminding us of, right? right? To be in his image is to image the creator. Right. And how we live and move and have our being. Yes. Yeah. So what do you think about the moves for Christian institutions then to sideline these programs in the arts and even cut, they cut art history, they cut courses in literature because they don't find them as vital to what they're doing as a Christian higher ed institution? Yeah, it, it's sad because, um, you know, they didn't cut for Angelico Studio out of Dominican order in the midst of uh, scarcity and uh, Black Plague and invasions uh, and, you know, excommunicated popes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these things saved our civilization. 
um, and it's not just um, extra, you know, nicety of, you know, when you have a budget, robust budget, you add the odds. No, it's it's fundamental to our learning. And um, it's actually stalked with this. Um, in my yeah, thesis, you know, again, if, you, if you're if you not making, um, you are not, you don't know what you believe. So so it would, the, the fruit of what you have created is exactly the, the test that, that the institutions of higher learning has to uh, be accountable to. And if you are, uh, you know, of course, STEM um, has has become, the, the, you know, kind of the pragmatic survival tool for, but um, I, I would make the case that students are not being able to uh, form their um, spirituality and form their humanity uh, without without the arts. Um, so it's it's fundamentally, um, um, you know, not not the way uh, Board or University ought to be thinking uh, in in that direction. You know, a pragmatic a utilitarian utilitarian pragmatism is what I call it. But right, which I absolutely agree with. I argue several in several places that the idol of use has taken over. Mm -hmm. all of our universities. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if we can't justify the usefulness, then we completely uh, throw out the program. Yeah, and, and it, it just goes to the extent, um, you know, on the sidebar here, but um, how much education has become a transactional commoditized um, reality. Um, even, even if you have a liberal arts curriculum, it doesn't mean that you are uh, in, in fact, uh, believe in, in, in the core values of what liberal arts came out of. Um, and, and so, you, you know, you're, you're educating uh, uh, students in, with a wrong premise to begin with, uh, which is, um, you know, you pay for, you pay your tuition to get a resumeable something so you can get a job. Um, you know, that's, that should be the least of what we should be concerned with, um, and um, we we cannot, uh, you know, and and uh, any kind of discussion on education with, without um, understanding that it, it goes much deeper. The formation of, uh, uh, you know, especially the four years or whatever uh, that on, in undergraduate level, which is so important, such an important formative time, and um, without the, the understanding of the holistic integrated view of education, we, we will uh, not have the, you know, the society that we, we, we can um, be uh, proud of and, and be able to be um, fully human in. I'm kind of throwing this at you, but um, you know, how do the creative arts form students in such a way that no matter what vocation or job they go into, it will help society flourish. Right. I was uh, speaking to Dean of Engineering at my uh, my school, uh, Bucknell University, where I serve on the board. And um, he said, you know, engineers uh, 10 years ago, they came in as freshmen. You had four years or four and a half years sometimes of training them to be that engineer. Uh, today, you can't do that because the, the technology and what you're teaching them in the first year is going to be obsolete by the, by the time they graduate. So what does he do? Well, he says to his freshmen, uh, that class, that you have to take liberal arts. You have to be experienced theater. You have to be a dancer. You know, mm -hmm. to understand this you know, nimbleness that mm -hmm. you're going to need in the industry to come. And you're not just building bridges to, to solve a problem. You're actually asking the question, what is a bridge? And in order to do that, you know, if, if you understand the collaborative, uh, especially in the theater, um, mm -hmm. or even as, as far as writing poetry, you, you are forced to reckon with the unknown, right? So you, so you have to apply your creativity and imagination to what doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And in order to learn that, you can't be in a traditional mindset. Of we, you learn this, you know, A, B, and C, and you'll be able to put that on your resume and you get a job where when that is actually the worst thing you can do. Because once you lock into those things, you know, that, that you thought will get you a job, it's going to be obsolete in four years. Well, do you mind telling everyone what you majored in? 
So yeah, so I majored in art. Um, I ended up, um, you know, being being passionate about my call as an artist. But but I also uh, studied animal behavior because I was interested in ontology and um, ecology. Uh, Bucknell had this uh, wonderful integrated program, and it was a liberal arts space. So you know, I I was studying uh, computer sciences sciences as well as you know um, uh, Darwinian <laughs> uh, evolutional. Uh, uh, sociobiology and and so forth um, and and then you know going to monkey labs that, that they had and sketching the monkeys you know and then going to the opera and and, and then um, you know painting but writing at the same time yeah. so, so these things continue I'm in a horse barn in uh, uh, Princeton right now and uh, yeah. what you see is uh, the result of Bucknell education. <laughs> that's I think that's so fantastic you know I was a creative writing major so I. Yeah. I walked around on the beaches and wrote poetry yeah. and recited poetry to all my friends. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's the right way to go. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you talked about the imagination and being able yeah. to imagine what's not there yet. Yeah. And in your book, you talk a lot about the sanctified imagination. Yeah. Uh, do you yeah. mind explaining what exactly you mean? Right. Um, so doc, Dr. Adam Davis, um, you know, has uh, lectured on imagination, biblical imagination, and says, you know, when the Bible talks about the heart, um, he, uh, the closest word both in Hebrew and in Greek is, is imagination. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about sanctification of your heart, um, you're talking about sanctifying your imagination. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we hear literally no sermons about this. Um, there's, there's no addressing of this issue in the church. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it has become an industrial way of, you know, what I call plumbing theology of fixing it with the tools that you uh, you learn to use in the church and applying it to fix the pipes when you go home, inviting a neighbor to use the pipes and, you know, use the tools and then, you know, you just keep going. But, the, you know, with the, what's going inside the pipes, why are we fixing the pipes? Those things are rarely addressed. Mm -hmm. And and so um, when we think about the, the water of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the new... Uh, new wine that is that's flowing from new creation back into uh, what we experience uh, in a uh, scarcity uh, mindset battle zones that we live in. You know, we have to retrain our imagination to not think in the way of scarcity and zero sum game, which leads to culture wars because we are filled with fear and anxiety saying that, well, we have to protect what we have when, when in fact we haven't done much to cultivate our imagination. So we can't as artists have always done to rely on the assumption of abundance and, and to the taste that you know, the new wine that is flowing back into our, uh, you know, wretched hearts. And, and, and that, that, you know, artists are instinctively doing that, we, even without um, uh, acknowledging God, or, you know, even sometimes going against God's principles, uh, they understand that what they have to um, bias themselves to is, is the um, understanding of um, abundance um, that, that, that they are feeding into. Yeah, you talk in your book about the connection between beauty and goodness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that a lot of people miss. They're really great about the Ten Commandments. They're really great yeah. about like, do this and don't do this. Right. But they don't understand that connection between beauty and goodness that is all through the New Testament. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind expanding on that? Yeah, so I quote C.S. Lewis, right? In Mayor Christianity, he says, you know, Christianity is not this more morality game where you train horses to jump higher and higher, in a, you know, to, to go over the hurdles of uh, moralism. But the, the, uh, in Christianity, God gives us wings and uh, we, we are to fly. Um, and uh, that is uh, very much um, uh, against the normative structures of how we are taught, uh, you know, as, as human, human beings, that we, you know, because we are, we are taught, even in churches, we are taught to jump higher and higher, to strive, to build your resume, uh, you know, and, and so forth. But no, we're, we're 
you know, uh, winged creatures mm -hmm. that is meant to uh, exercise our wings. Now, that means that it, you, you fail often, and uh, at least initially, and you also need a map once once you start flying, you know, you to, because you, you, you're empowered to explore, right, and to see the vast uh, beauty of, of the universe from a different vantage point. And that, that's part of our training to uh, sanctify imagination is to see beyond what we are um, you know, trapped in right now. And, and so that, that takes an enormous amount of um, understanding of uh, growth um, and, and also risk-taking. Uh, and would, uh, these, these, these things that artists have trained themselves to be good at. I'm thinking of uh, Lewis's The Abolition of Man, yeah. in which he talks about the problems with education is that we have thrown out this connection between beauty and goodness, yes. right? And we only use our head to define what is good mm -hmm. instead of creating people with chests, with emotional yes. responses to what's beautiful. And if we don't train them to love what they're meant to love, um, then we're gonna end up unmanning people. We're gonna unhumanize or dehumanize. And that's indeed what, what's happened um, in our education. Yeah, I, I remember um, David Lyle Jeffrey wrote a book, In the Beauty of Holiness. Yes, it's a beautiful kind of book, book. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I learned from that book that I think you have an example of this as well is the word in the New Testament for the beautiful act yes. that Mary does when she breaks the perfume at Jesus' yes. feet. We always translate it as the good act. Yes. But it's the beautiful it's act. It's beautiful act. Yeah, it's both and um, actually. Um, and, and that's, that's um, precisely the point, you know, that Jesus commends her for uh, doing, uh, you know, Mary did what she could uh, and, and she has done a beautiful thing and whatever the gospel is told, what she has done will also be told. What, what an amazing commendation that, that we, we forget when we are preaching or when we are leading worship. Um, is Mary here? <laughs> you know, is that can you detect the aroma of this extravagance, wasteful, uh, you know, nard that anointed Jesus as a king before the disciples could see that? Um, that 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 that's exactly what uh, I think the gospel reminds us of, and and um, that, that we need to. Uh, be part of worship that that is so extravagant that that be and beautiful that that people say like what oh, you know isn't this so costly isn't this so um, you know extravagant um, and and we rarely see those uh, today. Right, but it would draw it would draw people in in a way that I think we've forgotten how important that is. I mean, there's so much that people can divide over truth is this true is this not true even goodness is that good or is that morally right um but when it comes to beauty it's so hard for people to argue that notre dame cathedral should not have been you know renovated after the fire or that people should not have given money to that there it's just it's a more difficult argument because people really do respond to beauty yeah right yeah. they're really drunk Right, the beauty and mercy, they, they, they tend to be, be two things that the Darwinian universe, uh, you know, survival of the fittest model cannot count for. And yet, precisely because they, they, they are um, wasteful in that sense of, you know, calculated um, ways that, that we, you know, um, we win, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, that's why it's essential for God's uh, kingdom. Yeah, you know, I was at, um, I founded a school here in Silent Springs, Arkansas uh, for K through 12th grade. Okay. And one of the parents, when I talked about, we really need to integrate these art classes and music classes in our program mm -hmm. more, they need to be more cohesive. And he said, one of the parents raised his hand, um, but who are you to decide what's beautiful? You're just gonna teach my kids what's beautiful, like based on what? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. And so this is a big question for our cultures. They still think, well, but how, why do you get to decide? Yeah, because they, they assume that beauty is subjective and uh, there's, there's no basis for uh, understanding of beauty across, um, you know, hum, human beings. And, um, you know, you, you, you can certainly make that argument, but, but it doesn't bear witness to the reality 
um, you know, when we are all mesmerized by the sunset or fireworks or this, it is some beautiful music. Um, there, there's something very universal about what we understand to be beautiful. And it's often dictated by the world that we live in. And, um, you know, whether you live by a stream or whether you live by a mountain or we, we live in buildings uh, that you, you can't see outside, you know, these things affect us. Um, and human beings look for beauty um, no matter where they live. And, and if you don't, that, that, is, that is an indication that you have been compromised in, 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 in a severe way. Um, that, um, so it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, be, be, beauty is not in that sense in the eye of the beholder. Uh, the be, uh, be, beauty is recognizing what the beholder has, you know, sees in you. Um, and that, you know, that, that is a uh, fundamental uh, shift that the mind has to traverse um, if you want to communicate anything about the, uh, about the universe, or if you want to communicate anything about human heart, um, it, 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 it has to make that leap. Um, and, and so that, that's why beauty is fundamental to education because it is one of the ways that we get to across the chasm of, you know, to, to individuals or, you know, uh, uh, between us and God um, that we, we, we cannot, there's a divide and we cannot communicate without it. Right. And yeah, it connects us in a way that other things can't. Mm -hmm. You um, talked about when you were filming something for Silence and Beauty yeah. And you were actually in Tokyo and there was right. this connection that was formed. Do you mind telling that story? That yeah. Right in the book. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that story. And, and um, I am haunted by it as well. You know, we were um, filming and Susie Barra, who is my collaborator, longtime collaborator for music. She's a jazz percussionist and Andrew Nemer, who is a tap dancer. Uh, we were in Shibuya district and um, uh, pouring rain, uh, we were filming and um, tap, it, it, tap dance uh, being filmed in the streets of Shibuya meant that we had to bring these tap boards, uh, it, you know, very large uh, square uh, wooden boards and uh, they, uh, they were tapping and Susie was playing and and we were exhausted, you know, we got in the taxi to go go, go to the hotel. And uh, Susie had her son Emmanuel with us. He was nine at the time, and uh, um, I I had to sit in front because the you know we had four. Uh, three adults and one child in the back of the taxi. And this taxi driver was this classic Japanese uh, professional driver. You know, he had his white gloves, um, very courteous, and he, he welcomed us, you know, and he, I had to sit in front, so I sat next to him. And, um, you know, he asked about where we're from. And I said, you know, you have some uh, jazz percussionists uh, and uh, tap dancers in the back seat. And uh, he paused uh, a little bit and he said, you know, my wife, my wife was a drama and passed away last uh, summer. And I still don't know what to do with her drum set. And so I conveyed this to my team. And, um, you know, it was a short, ride it was like 15 minutes but uh, all of a sudden I hear started here this tap in the back and it was Emmanuel who apparently started it but he started tapping the tap board uh, with this percussive rhythm and Susie joined in and then Andrew and Neil uh, his buddy joined in and we had this cacophony beautiful concert a jazz concert in the back of a taxi and when we arrived at the hotel um, you know, of course, I, I, I paid him and um, I, I gave him a credit card. And the way he took the, the credit card was like it was a, the most precious sacred object that he's ever received. And uh, he, he thanked me and bowed deeply. And when he looked up, I, I, you know, he, he was weeping. And he said, isn't music amazing to communicate? Um, and, you know, later on, we were... Um, discussing what happened and you know I said that well that was that was new creation you know there was no sermon there was no explanation there was not nothing other than a simple 
child's response to what he heard about this taxi driver's um, grief. And um, that's new creation. You know, we, um, the, what we experience will remain forever etched in, in eternity. And in fact, it will be amplified because our God is a God of grace, a uh, God who takes what we do, the, 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 the fugitive little things that we create and multiplies them into um, magnificent permanence. Uh, and, and it will be waiting for us on the other side. Um, I, I have no idea what what this gentleman would would take away from that, but I know that something you know a cold of eternity touched his heart, um, and and uh, and that 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 would also remain in in eternity as well. I think that is such a beautiful story. It was also, I mean, it was a perfect example of what you talk about in your book. Um, and I apologize if I don't say this right, um, but is it Kintsugi? Kintsugi, yes. It's a perfect yes. example of yeah. Kintsugi, of in this broken age, the new creation. And so I would I would love for you to yeah. talk about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I've been designing these uh, Kintsugi boxes with uh, working with a Kintsugi master. Um, we launched this little thing called uh, Kintsugi Academy because I wanted to um, teach people how to do this and anybody can learn to do this uh, now with the kids that we develop. Yeah. And Kintsugi is a tea, part of the tea tradition. Uh, so, so we see evidence of it already uh, like 10th century, but later on in Japan, it became refined as part of Japan lacquer artistry. And uh, when and when a tea ware breaks uh, during earthquake or uh, tsunami, um, they, the family of tea masters will often keep the fragments for generations. And then when the time is right, they will give it to a Japan lacquer master and the Japan lacquer master will mend um, the, the pieces, fragments back together, but then use gold to highlight, as you can see here, um, you know, these lines are accentuated with gold. Um, and, and the resulting Kintsugi bowl is more valuable than the original. Uh, so, it's a beautiful metaphor, uh, rather than in Western terms, fixing and to you know erasing the fracture. Uh, Japanese have learned that fractures uh, can be beautiful, and and that it needs to be honored. That that you don't you know just wipe it away or pretend that it's not there, but but that it can become a river or gold uh, if you have the right master mending it. So instead of fixing, we are mending to make new. And that is true of our lives, obviously. And when we do a uh, Kintsugi workshop with people, we just started to train uh, leaders, but um, you know, they, they come away feeling that connection between their hands, what their hands are teaching them, uh, what, what they're experiencing, and uh, it literally can uh, cre create a way, passage for trauma to heal. Um, you you know when you, when you're burnt out, let's mm -hmm. say, and you just spend a few few hours doing this, you know your brain start to um, reconfigure itself. And uh, my um, clinical psychologist friend tells me that there are neurons that are that are reweaving or you know being nurtured to develop. Um, because because trauma, you know, separates, um, you know, these segments, and and so there's not enough connection. That's that's why we 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 struggle with anxiety because we, the brain is not functioning uh, in the way that it was it was made, and so when you make uh, new neurons uh, begin to form uh, connections. And so you will begin to see things, you know, think about things that you never thought about before. And oftentimes it, it's about our past, our traumas, our brokenness. And, and those things can be also amended, um, you know, and made new. Yeah, I love that. Um, especially it makes me think of like the Felix Culpa. I mean, it is the, it's the good fall. It's the brokenness. Yes. Has yes. To be pieced yes. Back together. I mean, it takes away all of our false ideas of perfectionism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, all we have before God are these unfinished symphonies or these yes. broken gifts to give him right. that he, he then right. mints with gold. 
Yes. Uh, I think that's a beautiful metaphor and a great way of understanding yeah. our age and our yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, well, one of my favorite parts of our book, if you don't mind turning there for yes. me, um, I love how you ended this. And I think it just shows so much that you're the kind of writer people can trust oh. um, because you're not writing for yourself. You are actually writing for the readers and you're talking to us. And so you ended with the benediction for makers. makers yeah. I loved it. Um, it's one of those things that I hope to share with my students. Yeah. It'll, it'll be part of the liturgy of my classroom oh, in the future. That, that, that is amazing. Thank you for that. Um, understanding that I, I, I am uh, amazed when uh, anything communicates, you know, as an artist, I think communication is impossible. You start there, right? And I, and I say in the book that, you know, God doesn't need us to do anything to fulfill his needs. So, so why is God creating? And, you know, it's because God is love and God, love exudes, right? And, and so anything that I do, anything that I write comes straight out of my studio to, uh, try to communicate that's something that is impossible to communicate. Um, so uh, anytime that, you know, somebody responds um, with uh, a, any kind of response, but in, in, the, in, the, in this case with this book, there's been so many times when I, I, I felt uh, there, there was a deep connection and a deep hunger for what I write here. And so I'm, I'm grateful for, for that, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, well, thank you for being so generous with your readers. Absolutely. So you want me to read that? Yes, please read the okay. benediction for makers. Okay. A benediction for makers. Let us remember that we are sons and daughters of God, the only true artist of the kingdom of abundance. We are God's heirs, princesses and princes, princes of this infinite land beyond the sea, where heaven will kiss the earth. May we steward well what the Creator King has given us and accept God's invitation to sanctify our imagination and creativity, even as we labor hard on this side of eternity. May our art, what we make, be multiplied into the new creation May our poems, music, and dance be acceptable offerings to the cosmic wedding to come. May our sandcastles, created in faith, be turned into permanent grand mansions in which we will celebrate the great banquet of the table. Let us come and eat and drink at that supper of the Lamb now so that we might be empowered by this meal to go into the world to create and to make and return to share what we have learned on this journey toward the new. Amen. That is so beautiful. Thank I know you. there are so many more things that we could talk about, um, but I hope this was enough of a teaser for people to go pick up your book, Art and Faith. And if people want to get in touch with you, should they be following you on Twitter? I am so easy to find. Thanks to my daughter. I'm on every social media known <laughs> to <laughs> human human uh, social media world. So uh, but yeah, please feel free to send me questions. I'd love to follow up with you, perhaps with your students, um, you know, and, and continue the conversation. Thank you.